Welcome to the third episode of Pope Snowflake and part two of Pius IX's implosion. Picking up after the failed 1849 Italian Republic, documented in part one, we move to the unification of the Italian peninsula in the 1860s. The uneasy political stalemate in the peninsula was finally broken in 1859 when the Sardinian kingdom allied with the French to drive out the Austrians. Kurtzer writes that the Italians, living in what had been Austrian-controlled parts of the Papal States, rose up to drive out the clerics and ripped down Papal banners. A groundswell of support aligned behind the revolutionaries and the independence movement gained momentum when the Italian hero and freedom fighter Giuseppe Garibaldi marched on the southern kingdom of Naples and forcing the king of Sardinia's hand to join in a move that ended up uniting the entire peninsula as the Kingdom of Italy in 1861 under Victor Emmanuel II, excepting Venice, which remained under the Austrians. The only other exception was Rome, and a small remainder of land around it, which was still garrisoned by French troops protecting the Pope, as discussed at the end of Part I on Pius IX. Pius lost all temporal power when the Papal States were no more, and after a millennia of Vatican rule, the lands of the Central Peninsula, were now a part of the new state of Italy. True to the typical response of the popes of the past century, in January 1860, he penned yet another encyclical, Nullis Certe Verbis, on the need for civil sovereignty, impotently demanding the return of his domains. Addressed to the clerics under his command and praising their dedication to preaching the official party line, Pius engaged the only tool at his disposal, papal rhetoric, that was completely devoid of any recognition of the new status quo. In this citation, Pius overlooked the inconvenient truth that God did not give civil power to the papacy, but it was the Frankish king, Pepin, who had done so. One civilian government bestowed civil power, and another took it away. The encyclical continued, We will, without fear, leave nothing untried in fighting bravely for the cause of religion, and for preserving the civil dominion of the Roman Church, and its temporal possessions and rights. This was wishful thinking on the Pope's part, and that of the Catholic faithful who hoped to see it materialize, as the Vatican has never recovered its civil control of central Italy. At the end of March 1860, Pius followed up the encyclical with a bull of excommunication, Cum Catholica Ecclesia, specifically mentioning those who had dared to strip him of his temporal power. Twice in the bull he alludes to his powerlessness, arguing as he is from a position of weakness, given his inability to be taken seriously as a civilian power. He continued his incessant grumblings in characteristic form of attacking not just the proponents of modernism, but anyone who also perpetuated the situation, using his only recourse of futile patrine rhetoric and scare tactics of exclusion. Then, in 1864, he issued two of the most controversial and embarrassing declarations in Vatican history, both of which are equivalent to a papal temper tantrum raging at the modern world. In the reactionary encyclical Quanta Cura, condemning current errors and the accompanying syllabus of errors, he ineffectively ranted against the modern heresies of secular liberalism and forbade all Catholic children to believe such evil ideas. I'll pause here to give people time to read and fully digest the sheer amount of narrow-mindedness contained in his snowflakery.
As to the syllabus of stupid, er, excuse me, errors, there are eighty erroneous issues to which Pius takes offense, and it would take too long to list them all. Here, though, are some of the cherries. I'll pause again to let viewers absorb the sulkiness of the Vicar of Christ to modern secularism. The arrogance and appallingly regressive attitudes expressed by Pius in mocking societal progress and benefits, though understandable from the context of a true believer who has accepted as fact centuries of self-serving papal rhetoric, were shocking even by the evolving democratic standard of its day, and not just retroactively comparing it against modern benchmarks of secular freedoms. Kurtzer notes that even the Cardinal Secretary of State thought this course of action would backfire, and subsequently even other European Catholic countries realized the Vatican was an outdated danger to liberty that needed to be checked. It is no wonder the Italian citizens wanted nothing more to do with this reactionary Pope and his band of zealous cardinals who sought to drag the Catholic faithful back into the Middle Ages and keep them there. In the end, Pius was mocked for his backwardness by anti-clerical voices, and Freemasons in Italy publicly burnt copies of his tirades. For the evidence presented in this episode, I hereby christen Pius IX as the Grand High Snowflake-in-Chief. If you like my content, please like and subscribe to get notified of new videos. Please also consider supporting my work by becoming a Patreon sponsor. You can also find me on the following platforms.